Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Welcome to episode 13. Today we are going to be briefly in Genesis 24 and then in Genesis 25. Genesis 24 is one of those stories that uh, it tells the whole story once and then tells it twice in the same chapter. And I don't completely understand that. But anyway, so Genesis 24 and 25, today we're going to meet Rebecca, Isaac's wife, and we're going to learn about their family, the twins that they have, Esau and Jacob, although we tend to say Jacob and Esau because preference is given to Jacob, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Spoilers, I'm already getting ahead of myself. So Abraham is getting old. He's about to die. Remember, he had Isaac when he was 100 years old, and so he's getting up, up there a little bit, and he needs to find a wife for his son Isaac. So uh, Abraham, we'll find out here in a little bit that Abraham at this point is about 140 years old. Okay. So 24, chapter 24, verse one, I'm not going to read all of chapter 24. We really need to get into the meat of 25, but chapter 24, verse one. Now, Abraham was old and well advanced in years and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and of earth, that you will not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So Abraham's dwelling in the future promised land. And he says, don't take a, a daughter from my son among these people. That will come back later when Moses is preparing the people to go into the promised land. And he tells them, do not marry any of the women of the land. So that's the first time we see that kind of indication that will be repeated in a few hundred years by Moses. But he says in verse four, but go to my country and my kindred and take a wife for my son, Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, who spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son there. And so the servant's gonna go, he's gonna end up in uh, the land of Nahor, it's it's a, a brother of Abraham's, and he's going to end up in this land. He's going to find this woman, a beautiful woman named Rebecca. He's going to ask her who she's from, where she's from. Finds out that she is essentially the grand niece uh, or whatever of Abraham, and he's going to be like, "Man, blessed be God who has led me to to the household of my my master Abraham," and he's going to put bracelets on Rebecca's uh, arms and, uh, and, and he's going to meet her, her brother Laban. Laban is her brother. Laban's an important character that we'll see here in a few chapters. And, and long story short, because it is a very long story, because the narrator tells us what happens. And then the servant tells Laban everything that happens that we literally just read. So it is a very long chapter and it ends with this in 2463 with the servant bringing Rebecca back. And it says, Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards the evening and he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold, there were camels coming. Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac took her and brought her into the house, sorry, into the tent of Sarah, his mother. Sarah's dead by this point, sorry. And she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, chapter 25, we need to unpack all this. Very, very important. It says this in verse one of chapter 25, Abraham took another wife. Maybe you didn't know that. Sarah dies and Abraham's like, ah, good riddance. Not really, probably. But he marries another woman named Keturah and they're going to have six sons. And you're thinking there were only two, right? Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael's gone. So he has these six sons. And then notice what, what it says in verse 5. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son uh, eastward to the east country. Why is Abraham sending away these other six sons? We already know the answer to that because only through Isaac shall your, your generations be called. Only through Isaac shall your people be blessed. So there are these six sons of Abraham in his old age that he sends away. He's already sent away Ishmael. You've got to kind of wonder if he's not just ticking off a lot of people who are going to hate the descendants of, of Isaac later. And the answer to that is yes. So then it says this. Verse seven, these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. The Bible will do this sometimes, and it can be confusing if you're not careful. 
sometimes what the Bible will do is when it's kind of done telling us in this case about Abraham, and it says, look, we're kind of wrapping up Abraham's life. There's nothing really significant to tell you about it. We're going to kill him off. Abraham died. He was 175 years old. Now, let me tell you some other things. And then he talks here in verse 17 about the death of Ishmael at 137 years old. But then verse 19, verse 19 says, these are the generations of Isaac. And if you've been watching along with us the last couple of weeks, you remember that anytime you see that statement, it's a rewind. Okay. It's a rewind. It's not the thing that happened next because what it tells us is these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, when Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah. So this is rewinding back into chapter 24. All right. So chapter 24, when he got married, he's 40 years old. Now we already know that Abraham is a hundred years older than Isaac, which would make Abraham 140. All right. I told you that at the beginning of today's lesson. So Abraham's not dead yet in this part of the story. We killed off Abraham in the beginning of chapter 25 because now the author of Genesis is wanting to move on with Isaac's life. He's wanting to tell you the story of Isaac. But one of the things that I want you to understand is that we have to be careful readers. And so don't just assume because Abraham's killed off in the beginning of chapter 5 that Abraham's not relevant for the rest of the chapter of 25. There's still stuff going on. I'll point this out to you. So look at verse 20 again. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan uh, Aram, the sister of Laban, we met him, the Aramean to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord God for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, the children struggled within her, and she said, If it is this way, why is this happening to me? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations, pay attention to verse 23, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. Very, very important. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Let's finish this thought. Verse 24. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, and his body like a hairy cloak. That is a really hairy kid. So they named him Esau. I just, like... I have friends who had babies with a full head of hair. Can you imagine a kid that comes out and you're like, oh, he's wearing a cloak. Like that's a little bit disturbing. So verse 24, uh, sorry, verse 25, the first came out red, his body hairy like a cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So Isaac is 60 when the twins were born, which means Abraham is 160. We learned earlier in the beginning of this chapter, Abraham died when he was 175. So did Abraham get to meet his grandkids? Yes. Got to spend 15 years with his grandkids. Why then did they kill Abraham off at the beginning of chapter 25? Because the author is going, we're done talking about Abraham. It's time to talk about Isaac now. That's all that's happened, which is why that statement in there, now these are the generations of Isaac, is a rewind statement. Remember to think of it that way. Now, what is significant about this? A couple of things. One Two nations are in your womb, two people. Uh, one will be stronger, Esau will be stronger than Jacob, but the younger, sorry, the older will serve the younger. This is counter to the culture where the, the firstborn was the one who received the birthright, where the firstborn was the one who received the inheritance. And God tells Rebecca, he tells her, look, you're, the, the older is gonna serve the younger, meaning that the second born son is going to have the lineage and the second born son is gonna be the one through whom the promise of God has continued. Why does that matter? Well, Abraham had two sons. We're not going to count the other six. Uh, he had two sons, one by his own will and one by the promise of God. And it was the second born son by which the blessing came. So the first born son did not receive the blessing. The second born son did. Here we have Jacob and Esau being born. Esau, the first born comes out and then Jacob grabbing his heel. And yet it will be switched so that so that Jacob is the one who is given preeminence and Esau is given kind of, I don't know, the, the shrug off kind of, he's just dismissed. And, and so the Bible will later say, Jacob, I have loved and Esau I have hated. We can talk about that and we'll talk about that in the future. But here we see again, God's promise being carried through the second born son. 
This is going to be a theme that we see throughout the whole Bible. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about Adam, and it says the first Adam was a life-giving being, talking about Adam from Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and it says the second Adam was a life-giving spirit, talking about Jesus. So there's a firstborn son and a secondborn son. We'll see some of this similar ideology in the New Testament, talking about how the Jews did not believe in God and did not receive the message of Christ. So Christ gave the gospel and gave the kingdom to the Gentiles, the secondborn son, so that they would bear fruit of it. And so there's this imagery throughout the Bible of, it, it, there's a lot of seconds. There's a lot of this, the significance of the second. Uh, it's, it's the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. It's David being the first true, really godly king of the nation of Israel. And then Jesus is called David, the son of David. He's the second David who reigns rightly. And so there's all this imagery of the second. And so Isaac was the second, Jacob was the second, and yet the blessings passing through the second. And so hold that in the back of your head somewhere, make a note of that, because you will see that in some other places. Uh, I alluded to this way too quickly. Saul was the first king of Israel, but he was the king that the people wanted. The Bible says he looked like a king. He, he was considered kingly. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. There was something about him that looked in stature and in, in presence king-like. But David was the second king, and that's the king that God chose. And so there's this, anyway, it's all throughout the Bible, super interesting, and I want you to kind of hold on to that. So uh, join me in verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in the tents. I, I am definitely more Jacob than I am Esau. Uh, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. He hunted for his dad, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field. He was exhausted. And Jacob said, sorry, Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is my birthright to me? And he said, swear to me, sell it to me. So he swore to him and he sold Jacob his birthright. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. And Esau despised his birthright. So let's get this picture in our head. From a cultural perspective, Esau is the one who is going to receive the inheritance and the blessing of his father. He's the one who the family line should be tracked through. It should be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau because Esau is the firstborn. Now, God tells Rebecca, while the two are still in their womb, the older will serve the younger. So God has already declared to the parents who the line will come through, that it will come through uh, Jacob. Jacob's cooking lunch one day. Esau comes in from the field from a hunt. He's hungry. And he says, give me some of that, yeah, that red stuff. And Jacob goes, I will if you sell me the birthright. So at this point, Jacob is trying to make it legal, right? God has said this before either one of them had come out of the womb, but... He's trying to make it legal. Give me your birthright. Sell me your birthright and I'll give you some stew. He goes, I'm about to die. What does my birthright matter to me? Think about this for just a moment. He's not about to die. There's got to be a loaf of bread or something somewhere nearby. He's probably just hunted up some game. Cook your own dadgum lunch. But he thinks so lightly of his birthright, he sells his birthright for the sake of some soup, some stew. And he despises his birthright. We go, all right, great. Interesting story. What does that have to do with anything? So glad you asked because in Hebrews chapter 12, there's a reference to this. And Hebrews chapter 12 is speaking to the Jews. All right. And it says this, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble for by it, many will become defiled. See that no one is sexually immoral. And here it is, or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single mill. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, even though he sought it with tears. And so here's this reference. We're going to see the rest of this story here in just a moment, in another day or two. But here, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, the Jews, he says, be careful that, that you don't fail to obtain Christ. Be careful that you don't, that you don't miss Jesus in this. He goes, because remember, when Esau forsook his birthright, when Esau forsook his birthright, he said, even though he wanted it later and he sought it later, he couldn't get his birthright back. And so the Bible tells us, we saw this yesterday, I believe, in Romans 9. Paul says that to the Jews belong the covenants. To them belong the promises. To them, it's their birthright. Salvation is the birthright of the Jews. And the 
author of Hebrews is saying, be careful that you don't despise your birthright Jews like Esau did. Because if you despise Christ, which is really what he's getting to, if you despise Christ later, even though you seek it with tears, there will be no opportunity for repentance. And so Esau is a picture of the Jews despising the birthright of Jesus. And again, the second son uh, is here in Jacob. And so I uh, hope that that stirs up your brain a little bit, gives you some things to think about. And I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.